Firstly, I would like to thank all those who involved in giving me this award and for the invitation to America to receive it. I would like to thank those who uh, proposed and voted for me and those of you who helped to organize uh, today's ceremony. For me, for a young woman from a very isolated part of the world, like Darfur, to have to come here today to receive an award of such important is a great journey. I am humbled and honored and so very grateful for this recognition and for the attention it may draw to the ongoing conflict in Darfur. There are many crises in the world today. Wars, starvation, natural disasters like tsunami and flooding. But my own life is a testimony to the one conflict that causing more death and suffering than any other today, but which seems to go so unnoticed and unreported. After the Rwanda genocide, the world pledged that never again. Would it stand by? as innocent were killed in the hundreds of thousands. Sadly, for too long, the world did just that in Darfur. No one knows how many have been killed. But the numbers run into hundreds, of thousands of victims, men, women, children, unarmed, innocent, defenseless. Each death is an individual. Each of those people a human being with hopes and fears and dreams just like my own. And some four million people have been driven from their homeland, therefore, and are forced to live in refugee camps which are places of hopeless frustration and despair. Even there, even today, some six years after the genocide by the attrition began, they are still not safe or secure. Those camps are attacked, women are raped, children are kidnapped. And so the world community still cannot exert itself to protect the people of Darfur. The world pledged never again, but in Darfur that pledge has proven a hollow. Today, there is a peacekeeping force on the ground in Darfur. However, the UNAMID force is awfully undermined, under-equipped, and ill-prepared 
to defend the huge number of vulnerable civilians that it is tasked to protect. Peacekeepers have been killed by Sudan government force. They are elite militia, like the murders, Janjaweed. The Unamid force is trying to do a job for which it is hopeless, ill-suited, with awful lack of support from the developed nation. In short, for the millions of refugees, the prospect of going home, because remember, for all of us, therefore is our home, is a distant dream. Our land is there. Our burned out villages are there, awaiting us to return and rebuild them. Our orchards are there, our forests for gathering firewood, and the graveyards of our ancestors. Yet, there is no security to allow us to go home. Every single one of those people in refugee camps just wants to go home, live in peace and security and with dignity, and to rebuild our lives. We know that the world turned out his face away when it could have made that phrase is never again really means something for the people of Darfur. We are angry and feel let down, but we have accepted that failure. But now, we ask that we be given the peace and security simply to allow us to return back to our homes. If the world could not guarantee never again in Darfur, will it not find the resources and capacity and the collective will to guarantee four million Darfuris the right to go home? We are patient people, but we know that time is running. As our people languish in refugee camps, we know that the Khartoum regime is resettling itself. The tribes that made us the murderers, Janjuit Milish, the devil horsemen on our most fertile land and in our most well-watered villages. The longer it continues, the less chance we have for ever retaining home. For our land will be occupied by those who killed our fathers and raped our children. Before our very eyes, the world failed to guarantee never again. But can it not at least guarantee us a homeland to return to? I saw the waves of devil horsemen riding into my village. 
I heard their cries as they taunted us, calling us black dogs and slaves. I heard them scream out that they would kill us, kill us all. I fled, but my father stayed to fight, and he was killed, as were so many of brave men in my village. They faced the clashing cough, assault rifles, and the Khartoum regime's helicopter gunships with little more than daggers and spears. And the odd, innocent hunting profiles. They stayed to buy us, women and children, the time to escape, so that we might live another day. Yet still, we languish in the refugee camps and cannot return back to our homelands. As a trained medical doctor, I treated the victims of the child rapes. Imagine it. Imagine a country where grown men and leaders draw up a policy of child rape as a weapon of waging war. This is what is happening in my country. The world failed to stop the horror. And still the refugee camps are not secure. I have seen the pictures of the children as young as five. Draw today of the horror, the memories of the trauma. Burned deep into their minds. I have heard their tears and their stories. And their screams at night as they dream the darkness of the nightmares. The least those children deserve is to be allowed home. Home for their mothers and sisters can rebuild their life in a loving, peaceful family. And the least every Darfuri deserve is justice. The International Criminal Court has indicted the president of Sudan and others for war crimes in Darfur. The move has been criticized by some as inflaming the conflict in Darfur. But there was a little could make it worse for us, for the survivors. And like all victims of an unspeakable horror, a genocide by rape, mass murder, and starvation. We crave justice and a reckoning we dream of that day. That the mastermind of the hero face punishment for these crimes. For us, for we, the 40 victims, there can be no real homecoming or closure without such justice being done. Imagine if a force of gunmen rode into your village 
and gunned down the inhabitants. Simply because their skin colors was different from yours. Imagine if they killed your father and raped your children and let your home scorched and burned ruins. And imagine if they halted and their blind justice forced you to flee from your own land. Imagine then how you would feel. That is how I feel. It's how every Darfur woman and child feels. It is the feeling of the entire people of Darfur. The world failed to deliver on never again. All we now ask is the right to go home in peace and freedom and for justice to be done. Is it too much to ask? I hope not. Every day I pray and I dream that we are given those two things. I'm so grateful for this award and to be given the chance and the platform to speak. I'm just a voice for the millions of others. I'm speaking because I cannot speak. Locked away in the refugee camps as they are. Last year, I wrote a book telling my life story called Tears of the Dirt. When the British journalist approached me and suggested I speak out, I wondered who might be interested. My story was like the hundreds of thousands of other Darfur women who had suffered unspeakable war crimes. Who could be interested? What difference one voice can make? One story, one cry in the darkness make. Yet, the reaction to me telling my story in that book proved to me what an enormous difference one voice can make. I hope today my one voice, my one cry, my one small story can make a difference for the all of the people of Darfur. Thank you.